There is a ritual that occurs in classrooms all across the nation. Children sit or stand in a circle, and they say their name, and what they did over the summer, and a useless fact about themselves. Maybe it's their favorite color, favorite animal, favorite flavor of ice cream. Going around the circle at the beginning of the year, there was Kaya, Devante, Kieran, Hunji, and with all these new names and faces, I began to wonder, as did Shakespeare, what is in a name? And a more modern source tries to answer that question. According to a well-trusted online dictionary, a name is a meaningless word assigned to you that lets people judge you before they know you. Well, okay, that's Urban Dictionary, but this statement is more true than anyone would care to admit. Our names have an impact on the way that we see others and the way that others see us. But as a label, they're not effective in describing what's inside. So let us look beneath introductions to understand what implications our names have. Then let us explore the impact mispronunciation can have before finally learning a few new ways to remember names. Now when we first hear someone's name, we immediately have an idea on who we think that person is. Maybe Barbie's just a name for dumb blondes or Sheldon's just a name for nerds. We don't all have the same idea. There's always an image. When my soon-to-be friend Kaya first introduced herself, no one thought much of it. But she then went further to explain that her parents had named her after a Bob Marley song, which uses Kaya as a term for marijuana. After this introduction, I'm afraid many of my friends had a different idea on who we thought Kaya was. Now, of course, your view of someone changes the more you get to know them. The name association can be very strong. Just take the name Brittany, for example. In 2000, the census reported that more than one in every thousand girls had the name Brittany. The name then sharply decreased in popularity, so that by 2010, only 0.1 of every thousand girls had the name. Now, this can be due to many factors, and not directly due to Britney Spears' 2008 breakdown. Another example is the name Monica, which in 1996 was the 81st most popular girl's name. It's since dropped to 560th, and you won't find someone named Adolf no matter where you go. To keep track of these trends, the Department of Social Security publishes the top 100 baby names for each year. And in my 8th grade class, we had plenty of names in the top 100, and they all sort of sounded the same. There was Hannah, Anna, Anna, Carmen, Katie, Catherine, Caitlin, Karen, Kaylee, Cora, and Bridget. It's fascinating how so many parents chose such popular names, given that parents can name their kids anything. Well, almost anything. This past year, the Telegraph reported that a judge in the United Kingdom ruled that a mother in Wales could not name her daughter Cyanide. Instances where the courts step in are even more uncommon in the United States, just ask Saint or Northwest. But one universal rule remains. All children are entitled to a name. The United Nations declares this as an inalienable right. Having a name legally documented makes you a citizen, and with that comes rights and protections. This is a real issue in developing countries where birth certificates are not a guarantee. Without a name, you are a nobody in the eyes of the government, making you extremely vulnerable to human trafficking. A name gives a child an identity and a story that will help them in their future. But what happens when society's view of their name is hurt in the future? A 2004 experiment was published in the American Economic Review. It explains how they sent out identical resumes to help wanted ads, but gave half the resumes white-sounding names, and gave half the resumes black-sounding names. The resumes that had the white-sounding names, Greg and Emily, received 50% more callbacks and interviews than the resumes that had the names Lakeisha and Jamal, despite having the same qualifications. Snap judgments based on names are not just happening in the workplace. A working paper brought to the American Bureau for Economic Research in 2005 looked at the classroom. The author suggested that teachers use a student's name as a signal of unobserved parental contribution to that child's education and expect less from children whose names sound like they come from uneducated parents. The author then goes on to explain that teachers rarely do this on a conscious basis. So a name like Lakeisha or Jamal would not only be overlooked in the interview room, but also in the classroom. As we begin to understand that our names come with preset images and preset biases, what happens when you come across a brand new name? Last week we had a substitute teacher, and now she's going through roll call, the Hannah, Anna, Anna, Carmen, Katie, Captain, Kitten, Karen, Kaylee, Cora, and Bridget type names were not a problem, but we all knew it was coming. The sub brought off a few more names and some students started to pass nervous glances because you know it isn't going to end well. There's always the hesitation, the reread, and the look of terror before the sub says, 
he, why, nigh, and almost on cue, comes a correction from my friend, who informed the sub that it's pronounced Hanji. This is an all too common situation, and no one substitute teacher is to blame. Unfortunately, many international students are choosing to adopt Western names instead of have Americans mispronounce their given names. This can create a unique set of challenges, most interestingly being the challenge some Chinese students have had with finding common Western names. A national public radio segment explains how one American woman has set up a website in China to help her Chinese students generate Western names. This is after she had come across names such as Cinderella, Bingo, Billboard. But is all this really necessary? Hanji shouldn't forget her Korean name simply because it looks difficult on paper. Sometimes cultural expectations and name association combine. In my freshman history class, day in and day out, all year, my friend Kieran was called Quran by our teacher. Now for the first semester, we would always correct her. She would apologize and feel bad, but she would continue to call him Quran until Kieran just gave up and he accepted his name being butchered for the rest of the year. Looking back on it, I can't help but wonder if it would have been easy if Kieran was a redhead of Irish descent instead of Pakistani. The president of the National Association for Bilingual Education said that mispronouncing a student's name truly negates his or her identity, which in turn can hinder academic progress. And the National Education Association agrees and adds that these effects can be long lasting. In 2012, Coley and Daniel Salonzo examined this issue in an essay titled, Teachers, Please Learn My Name, Racial Microaggressions in the K-12 Classroom. They concluded that the failure to pronounce a name correctly has an impact on the well-being and social emotional status of a student, which of course is linked to learning. Our names are more than just the meaningless word Urban Dictionary says they are. They have a serious impact on how we see others and the way that others see us. But what are we to do in our modern diverse society? The best thing to do is to simply get better at names. If it's just the remembering of names that always slips your mind, Forbes magazine published these tips and tricks to remembering names. First of all, when you meet someone, always repeat their name back to them. It shows that you care, you want to get it right. Second, if you're a visual learner, ask them to spell the name out for you. That way you can see it in your head. Next, once you know the name, try to remember some small fact about the person. And that's where those useless facts from the first day of school actually could come in handy. Maybe Ryan likes red or Katrina likes cats. Finally, if you can't remember a quick fact, try to make some type of personal connection. Maybe it turns out your new lab partner's name is Joe. Hey, that's your dad's name. And they have the same level of knowledge in physics. These are the traditional tips to remembering someone's name. But if you are someone whose name is constantly mispronounced during a roll call, there's no one after that. Facebook now allows users to add a phonetic pronunciation guide next to their name, and even link to an audio recording of them saying their name, so that their friends, both on screen and in real life, can learn to pronounce their name correctly. There's many different ways you can use face-to-face -face communication or technology to ensure that your name and the name of those around you are pronounced correctly. We now understand that our names come with preset images and preset biases, and that mispronunciation can have a drastic impact on those around us. According to the National Association for Education Statistics, an estimated 3.7 million children are gonna start kindergarten next fall. And as their classroom, our culture, and our world become more diverse, we're going to come across more names that could twist our tongues. But before we let a name become a label of any sort, we need to take a moment and examine our biases associated with the name. That way we can look beneath the name tag to truly get to know those around us. So hello, my name is Catherine, and I like cookie dough ice